I see on our chat screen, a guy named Shane says, how do you come out to family about being an atheist? That's the question of the century, isn't it? I think that the advice I usually give to people is just when you come out as an atheist or whatever, you got to make sure that you're not trying to convince them that you're not making the conversation about them. You, uh, you should make it about you. The reason that you go into their living room or they come into yours and you say, I'm an atheist and I wanted you to know this about me. You do that because you want to make a declaration as to where you're at. But it's almost always a trap. It feels like a trap or it's a trap that we allow ourselves to fall into because they then want to sort of complain or contradict or convince. So they'll say, but what about this? Where do your morals come from? Well, what about this proof of the Bible? What about this prophecy fulfilled? Whatever. And then our first inclination is to jump in and become the counter-apologist. And it is, I've fallen into the trap myself. Before you know it, you just changed the temperature of your meeting. Instead of saying, this is kind of where I'm at, I just wanted you to know. Now you've allowed yourself to get sucked into a debate. And this is just so frustrating. It's, it's maddening. It's, it almost never works out. You were not going to convince the religious at that moment. And the purpose of your visit was not to convince them anyway. It's a declaration that I don't believe in God's and my life is amazing, and I'm happy with where I'm at, and I'm going to pursue truth on my terms. And And I just want to make sure that all of you knew that and to know that I'm still the same good person I always was, and I'm going to do my best to live an honest life, and thank you very much, and I love you all. You know, right? You just, the purpose of coming out, that meeting is for you to declare where you're at, and then get out, or change the subject, or whatever it takes to not get into that. Well, actually, if you read the book of Genesis, well, actually, if you look at the history of the authorship of the Gospels, well, actually, if you look at the overwhelming evidence for evolution, I mean, it, it, it is such a natural thing for us to want to just jump in and, and tell them why. Almost nobody's interested in why. They're going to be concerned. They're going to be weird. They're, they might even cry. Who knows? what you're going to encounter, but you just need to make sure that the meeting is about you. Explaining where you're at, a declaration in relatively simple terms, give them a chance to digest, disconnect, and then you can come back later and get into the specifics of the why. And, you know, I allowed myself to get sucked into, I don't know how many conversations. (laughs) And after a while, I realized that it just wasted my time. And life's too short to have our time wasted. Life's too short to have our our energies and resources wasted. Life's too short to be frustrated and try to fix something that in that moment will not be fixed. So coming out to your family needs to be on your terms, on your timing. Make sure the meeting stays about a declaration of where you're at and then pull the plug regroup, and then the deeper conversations can come. You can get deeper into that onion. You can do it in writing. You can do it uh, um, on a phone call later. You can sit down with him over coffee later. And and uh, that that's a whole different conversation. That's just kind of my thing. And uh, my, you know, my family will, my parents will never change that. I don't think they'll never change the mind. Uh, Seth, you do not often draw the parallel between the falsehood of religion and the falsehood stated by some political and economic leaders. I'm not sure exactly what your point is, Billy Bob. I don't run a political channel. We do talk politics because theocracy is involved in politics. But... If you're talking about authoritarianism and those types of things, well, we just did a show on cults and cult thinking and cult leaders don't at all have to be religious. So it's applicable in politics and elsewhere. Uh, Let's see. I came out to my mom at an IHOP. What made you get off the hook from religion? That's a long story. I wrote about it in a book called Deconverted. The short version is I finally read my Bible and studied 
the religious claims I had once assumed and realized it was all a bunch of crap. Was it Isaac Asimov who said the most potent force for atheism ever conceived is the Bible? I'm paraphrasing. Uh, someone else uh, says, Theremin Trees has a great video called Coming Out, which outlines the whole business. Fantastic. Uh, someone said something about caffeine. Favorite mug. Um, except for, of course, the thinking atheist mugs. Uh, what else is happening? Right now, we're just sort of drifting through the comment section. I'm interested in... Um, I just posted a video with Anthony Magdabosco about uh, street epistemology, using the Socratic method in dialogue with believers. And, uh, you know, I've softened my own approach about how to approach the religious. And, um, you know, so often we barge in and try to convince them. I was so naive when I first came out as an atheist. I thought to myself, well, I've got this overwhelming sort of toolkit filled with evidence. I would uh, walk into a room and just think, as soon as they hear what I just heard, as soon as they've understood what I just understood, they'll be happy to discard their religious faith. And they'll walk away, they'll shuff off, slough off all this stuff, and they will, uh, they will uh, follow me into apostasy. And... Um, of course, it's monumentally naive because people don't believe usually for logical reasons, right? They have a religious faith for a number of other reasons, whether it's a cultural thing or childhood indoctrination or uh, whether or not it's um, you know a comfort mechanism, a coping mechanism, whatever. And uh, I used to get so frustrated because I would say, well, this is clear. I mean, if you look at the dismantling of the accuracy of the Bible. I mean, anybody can look at the Bible and realize that this is totally unreliable as a source of history, morality, science, reason, blah, blah, blah. And yet I was making no headway. And I, I would get so frustrated. My gut would be in a knot. I would find myself resenting the people I was having these sort of uh, conversations with. And I was at a, an event. I was at the Ark Encounter protest in Williamstown, Kentucky. We were protesting Ken Ham's $100 million waste of space, this huge-ass arc. And there was a guy there. His name was Seth, and and uh, he was a religious guy. I don't know if he was part of the Ark Encounter staff or if he was just a you know believer who decided to go and talk to those atheists. And he was walking around in discussions with people. And I he was talking to three atheists, and they were having a, a discussion. I mean, it was an amicable discussion about... Uh, religious faith and his faith in Jesus. And I didn't want to jump into somebody else's thing, so I was kind of sitting in the periphery and I was waiting for a natural beat, a natural pause where I could kind of pop in and ask a question. And um, so, I mean, it went on for a few minutes and, and finally everybody sort of came to a natural pause. And I said, may I ask you a question? I said, um, does it bother you that the Gospels that talk about your Jesus don't agree with each other and were obviously not eyewitness accounts of what had happened? And he went off into this sort of uh, thing. Well, it was reporting. You know, they were reporting at the time, and uh, you know, they would have different vantages, so the stories would come from different angles, which is why Jesus' last words would have appeared this to someone, to that to someone else, and you know, the standard apologetic kind of a kind of an answer. And uh, then I backed off of, you know, the, the facts of the gospel, and I started to talk about faith. Do you believe in Jesus on faith? Absolutely. Do you have faith in your God? The one true God is Jesus. Absolutely. And uh, I said, well, if an Islamist came to you and, and said, I have absolute faith in Allah, would you accept that? And he said, honestly, he said, no, but he is operating on faith, right? He has had an encounter, a personal encounter with Allah, which in his mind is just as real as your encounter with Jesus. 
why wouldn't that bear just as much weight if you're playing the faith card? And he was kind of hemming and hawing and hemming and hawing. And um, I looked him in the eye, and this had, we'd only been talking for about three minutes. And I said, do you think it's possible, given your upbringing, he'd admitted he'd been raised in the Christian faith, do you think it's possible, given your upbringing, that you are treating your own religious belief with a different set of rules than other religions? And he looked me in the eye and he said, yeah, that's very possible. Now, in the past, this is where I would have like been inclined to go for the kill, right? Aha, you just admitted to it. I mean, you know, to chest thump and claim victory and plant a flag there and, you know, to do those kind of types of things. But instead, as a street epistemologist, I just said, thank you. Well, th- that's an honest answer. And I appreciate, I appreciate your being so candid. Thank you very much. You know, it was nice to meet you. And I extended my hand and I shook his hand. And that was the end of the conversation, right? Because the first encounter with someone when you are doing street epistemology, when you're using the Socratic method to try to get people to examine how they got to where they are, why they believe with with, whatever they believe is, is not to win, right? You simply are trying to get them to reflect on how they got here. And uh, I don't know if, you know, he's went back and began to consider, well, how, you know, how do I approach faith in my life and why, Uh, Am I approaching my own religion with a set of preferential rules? Why would the standards be? He may or may not be doing that. But, you know, a seed of something has been planted, something that then he can take ownership of as he he continues in his own journey. I I just found it, it was was satisfying because we left as friends. He's the kind of guy I'd sit down and have coffee with and uh, seem like he's a... Uh, a good a good person who just happened to believe in a Jesus, his Jesus. Um, it was a, an exercise in street epistemology. And, you know, I, I'm more and more of encouraging other people. It's not a magic bullet. It's not a catch-all. It's not something that, that uh, you know, is going to work in every occasion. But when we're out there, instead of trying to win with evidence against people who are simply going to reinforce and double down and build the wall and do this, right? Uh, instead of trying that, why in the world don't we start to say, well, how did you get there? You know, would you hold someone else's belief in the same regard if they used that process to get there and they achieved a different answer? You know, it's just interesting to watch people sort of uh, mull over their own processes in that way. For a whole lot of people, it's the first time they've ever done it. First time they've ever done it. Oh, I see a, a super chat and a donation. Thank you so much. It's, how do I say it? Is it a darsh? Thank you very much. You're very kind. Um, will I be doing any videos on the Jehovah's Witnesses? I have a podcast on the Jehovah's Witnesses, which I think is going to be a better resource. It's a much more in-depth broadcast. came out a few years ago. You can just search it on blogtalkradio.com, the Thinking Atheist Jehovah's Witnesses. Brian says, is it okay to call yourself an atheist that is not a Christian anymore, even if I've not really studied the Bible, because my mom wants me to since coming out to her? I'm not sure I understand the question. Is it okay to call yourself an atheist that is not a Christian? Well, of course she wouldn't be a Christian. Um, Is she saying that she wants you to call yourself a Christian? Because it's less stressful and less controversial to the people in your circle? Um, ultimately, I'm not sure that we call ourselves what we call ourselves to keep other people comfortable. You and I aren't on this earth to make sure that everybody else is comfortable. I think you should own it, whatever you are, as much as you can. If you're an atheist, if you don't buy it, if you don't believe, I'm an atheist. I'm non-religious, if you want to call it non-religious. I'm a non-theist. I am a religious skeptic. Hell, you can be uh, proactive and just say, I'm a humanist. If you don't want to get into whether or not you believe in a God, you can be a humanist. Um, But I don't think someone else should ever dictate how you frame your own opinions, mindset, perspectives. Um, You're not here to keep everybody else comfortable. I hope that answered your question. Um.
I'm writing a song I think you'll dig. Your God is an awful God. He reigns in heaven alone with hatred and famine below. Your God is an awful God. Bacon cheeseburger knew religion was bullshit by the time there were 10. You can imagine. Would I ever come and tour the UK? Would I ever bring the unholy trinity? Well, we don't really tour as the trinity. We're all buds, but uh, that was kind of a short-term run that we did together. I didn't... We were becoming so closely associated with each other that it was hard to go out and do anything independently. It was just three buddies who got together and decided to put together a tour. And so um, uh, there have been people who have asked for a reunion. If me, Matt Delahunty, and Aaron Ra will ever go back and tour again, I don't, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's possible. Um, Brian says, again, ever since I came out to mom as an atheist, she told me to study the Bible in hopes I'll return to my faith. Well, that's a natural inclination. Usually what I get is just pray and seek God and he'll reveal himself to you or seek Jesus. This is a natural parental response. Uh, I encourage you, study the Bible. <laughs> you know, man, go ahead, study the Quran, study the Vedas, uh, study science, study names and claims of all shapes and stripes. Uh, we need to understand, we need to know what we believe, what we don't, and why. And I think study is where that begins. Please make a, a video on Hinduism. Um, I wrote a little bit about uh, Hinduism in my book, Sacred Cows. I don't know, have we done a whole broadcast on the Hindu? I don't think so. Possibly. The challenge with Hinduism is it's just freaking massive. The subject matter is massive. And thousands upon thousands of years of, of, I don't know how many, do they have thousands of gods? They have so many deities that uh, represented so many ways in so many different cultures. Oh, just crazy. Jordan says, Seth, which book do you recommend for a faith-questioning guy? I know it's cliche. Richard Dawkins, The God Delusion. It's the best one. It, it's been over 10 years. It remains the best one. If uh, you want somebody who was formerly religious, there's a Canadian evangelist, kind of the Canadian Billy Graham. His name is Charles Templeton. He passed away, but he wrote a book called Farewell to God that I thought was uh, it was very palatable for those who are in the faith and questioning Christian faith. Dan Barker's Godless sort of runs along those lines. They're, they're, uh, they're not hit you over the head with a baseball bat type books. They're, they're not telling religious people that they're stupid for believing they are honest, critical looks at religious claims and beliefs from the perspective of those who once claimed and believed them. So that's where I would start. But, you know, the God delusion, if whoever's reading can get past the fact that, you know, Dawkins is a firebrand atheist out there, the content of the book remains some of the most well-worded stuff when it comes to challenging religious faith, religious belief, religious operations and organizations. It's just a masterpiece. I mean, it just, it changed the game for me. Uh, can I make a video on evolution for dummies? Well, actually, I did. Um, it's not evolution for dummies, but it's a digestible piece that features a presentation with geologist and paleontologist Dr. Donald Prothero. We shot it in Dallas, Texas a few years ago. It's called Evolution, What the Fossils Say. Look it up on YouTube. He gives example after example after example after example of the proof of evolution, including human evolution. The presentation runs about an hour and 20 minutes. It is a creationism killer. And even he at the beginning says that, you know, you don't have to be an atheist to accept the fact of revolution. Hell, the Catholic Church finally came to its senses on evolution a couple of decades ago. John Paul II, you know, this myth that you are you have to be a an atheist to be an evolutionist is just bullshit. Um, there are a great many people. Hell, uh, Ken Miller, the evolutionary biologist, he's a Christian, but he holds to the fact of evolution. So does Francis Collins. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's that's where I'd start. Evolution, what the fossils say, Donald Prothero. It's on my channel, or you can search it on YouTube. Seth, do you find that, like, this is Jonathan, lifelong atheists have a lot of trouble understanding an ex-religious atheist experience? 
I think they're more curious. They have a hard time relating in some ways, but I think a lot of them get it. I mean, they may not understand the power of indoctrination. A lot of them will say, well, I knew it was crap when I heard it when I was nine years old. How did someone else hear it when they were nine and they bought into it? What's the difference? And um, I think the difference is, is that, you know, when you're surrounded by everybody who's saying it and thinking it, and you are in the cocoon of fundamentalism, constant reinforcement as an impressionable young child, and, you know, maybe you're a certain personality type, who knows? There's a ton of different sort of metrics that go into the equation. I think, you know, a trusting young person, a vulnerable young child, you bet. You know, if they're told this and then everybody around them, and even if they have a doubt, they've been taught that if they doubt they're in sin or they're being attacked by Satan, they don't want to go to hell. So that fear of hell keeps them from questioning. So then they become these sort of ambivalent Sunday Christians, Christians in name only. There's a lot of that going on. But, you know, sometimes it is hard, I think, for the lifelong atheist to relate. But I also think that many lifelong atheists totally understand that uh, you know these people are victims and that religion gets people while they're young the 4 to 14 window they find these young and impressionable people adults in a vulnerable place in their life and they go and target them and try to try to co-opt them into religious and superstitious thinking uh you're right Aaron Ross systematic classification series is also a great view of evolution thank you Ross for that why is heaven seen as a reward? Even a blissful eternity eventually becomes a repetitive nightmare. And we agree, right? An eternity of holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And if eternity truly is forever, everything becomes meaningless. Everything becomes meaningless because it is forever. And I think, you know, it's the preciousness of life, the temporary nature of life that makes everything so critical. Let's see. Um, does someone call atheism a religion? <laughs> I'm not even going to bother. Uh, let's see. Seth Dannon says, Seth, my dad's a minister. How do I get him to stop being distraught over my soul? Why do you think he loves a God that he thinks will harm me? My dad thinks that his God, whom he adores, is going to cook me forever in hell. I can't figure that one out. I've actually asked him the question. Do you love God? Yes. Do you think I'm going to burn forever in hell? Yes. Do you think that God created hell? Yes. Well, how do you love God? Well, God is just. He's, just, he's a victim of bad ideas. But you can't get someone else to not be or be something. And that's something we've had to surrender, I think. You and I have to surrender on our own lives. You can't control how this person operates or says or, um, or acts or thinks. You can do your best to try to educate them and show them that you are indeed in a good place and that you don't require all this suspicious thinking. But you can't control whether or not someone else grieves for you or prays for you or whether or not they have guilt or shame because they failed in some way or whatever their mindset is, that's out of your hands. And you're going to have to, to realize that you can't change their mind and heart. I mean, they're going to have to make that change. You can live the example of a loud, proud, secular life, but you, know, you can't control how someone else thinks. Beyond that, I think you're going to have to you know, decide uh, whether or not uh, boundaries are being respected. So if this person is injecting negativity into your life, then you may have to have a card conversation rather about uh, uh, you know, how much of that you're going to allow. Could atheism be considered a political viewpoint? No. Atheism is the non-belief in deities, period. Thank you for teaching us the wank puffin. I don't even know what that means. I've been learning British insults after the uh, London protest in regard to Trump. I love them. Why in the world haven't I heard many of these words before? I think, uh, was it wanky plonker? Or wait, manky plonker? Or, or is it is manky an adjective? or a, an, I think it sounds like an adjective. And then plonker is obviously a noun. What is that? I don't know what that is. But it's awesome. Wank puffin. Uh, someone else said cockwomble. These are amazing insults. Why in the world have am I 50 and only now hearing them? 
And of course, I can't do any justice to the music of these insults because I don't really know how they're used in conversation. But it's been a fun uh, point of conversation out there. Uh, let's see. Theremin trees. Yes, I will. Um, I'll throw up a feeler out and see if um, I'll see if that person is interested in having a conversation. Seth, would you do a show with the prophesied Antichrist, the founder of an anti-Christian religion? I have no idea who that person would be. Um, it could be considered a poli- atheism is not a political viewpoint. Atheism is the rejection of a belief in God. Now it might inform. Like my non-belief in deities informs my humanism, and my humanism does inform my political, you know, whether or not I'm pro this or that or social programs or welfare or or health care or I'm anti-death penalty or pro-weed or, you know, those types of things. But atheism in itself is not a political viewpoint. Um Studies of holy books are indeed a good way to get someone out of religion. How do you understand that most religious people prefer to remain uninformed and to enjoy superstition and ignorance? I mean, this is, uh, religion is, religion is um, what they have cloaked themselves in for decades in many cases. I mean, it's, it's comforting. They get up in the morning, they, their friends are religious, they're welcomed every Sunday, they have religion comforting them in their moments of need and crisis. They're in the hospital where they worry about death and seeing great grandma so-and-so again. Religion is the balm that they use to try to deal with this often harsh real world. And of course, many people would rather live in a happy fantasy than acknowledge a more difficult reality. I honestly think that that's, uh, we shouldn't lie to ourselves. Now, happy is not happy is an important goal, but happy shouldn't trump the truth. Ira said, Seth, you are my hope and inspiration that reason will triumph over superstition. Love the Thinking Atheist podcast. You're very kind, Ira. Um, thanks for the donation, by the way. It's greatly appreciated. Thanks, by the way, too, for those who support me on Patreon. It's weird, you know, we're in this spot now where you know, when I started podcasting, there were some podcasts, but now it's weird. Everybody's got a podcast. Like everybody as a podcast. Um, I mean, everybody's got a podcast and almost all podcasters seem to be using Patreon and I'm glad it's there. It's been a great resource. So here you are as the audience and you're in this interesting place where you've got to, you know, decide uh, where your resources are going to go. Well, I listen to seven podcasts, but I, you know, I can't afford to support every one of them. And and, uh, you know, what happens if there's an indie band and I want to support them and here's so-and-so who's doing another form of art or, or production and I want to support them. And I realize your resources, it's hard sometimes to put, to, to prioritize those, but, um, it means a lot, you know, it's, it's, uh, I'm thankful for the advertisers and clients I, I have for the thinking atheist blog talk radios ad model is changing a little bit. So the patrons are actually more important to me than ever, but. Uh, for those who are not on Patreon, just real fast, uh, you get a commercial-free version of the broadcast. So I go back and I whittle out the commercial segments and just streamline that sucker. And then you get it Sunday instead of Tuesday. And then I try to do an extra show uh, every month for you. I'm going to try to maintain that, but it's, given the amount of content that's coming out of the studio, it's hard to it's hard to really maintain that full time. But uh, it matters. It really does. It allows me to to host to to help admin this community. It helps me to, um, to do what I do. And, uh, you, you, you just have no idea. So if you want to be a supporter, it's patreon.com slash Seth Andrews. Uh, let's see, uh, the handmaid's tale. Yes. The handmaid's tale just finished season two, no spoilers, but it is one of the greatest things on television. You can find it on YouTube. Um, Atheism political, atheism political. I'll let you guys hammer that out. I've weighed in. There was an organization years ago, it was almost 10 years ago, that was at the National Atheist Party. 
They attempted to create a political party centered around atheism. I think I said at the very beginning, oh, this is a bad idea. <laughs> you know, why center a political party around atheism? Because you, you know, you've got all shapes and stripes of of people who don't believe in a god, but it doesn't necessarily align them in terms of uh, of their roles of uh, government and and uh, you know whether or not they are this or that may or may not uh, line up around. You know, atheism is just one thing. Uh, you know, I'd see more of a humanist thing than an atheist party for sure. Um, there are some atheists. There are some atheists who are um, who are proud supporters of the GOP and Donald Trump. As a humanist, I have a hard time jiving that sometimes. But um, uh, let's see. I'll continue for just a few more. If anybody else has a comment or question. Uh, did you get yourself a Discord server? No, I did not. In fact, I'm a little bit in the dark as to Discord and w how it works. So. I am still gaming occasionally. I might even try it this afternoon as a reward for meeting some deadlines on the audiobook. Ghost Stories will release to audible.com in September. There are uh, a few stories that you will recognize uh, from previous broadcasts. Uh, Two or three of them are just verbatim. And then uh, there was one I did called, uh, it was called Lydia. It's like, I think the first one I ever wrote. And I uh, and my listeners were just unhappy with the story. Like the bones of the story were good, but it, it left everybody hanging. It didn't really go anywhere. It was an unsatisfying journey. You know, you, you had this big buildup and then a huge anticlimax. And it bugged me. And, and the more I saw comments from listeners, the more I realized they were right. You know, this, this was, uh, there was no payoff. And so early this year, first part of the year, I went back and I revisited Lydia. And I, I uh, just sort of deconstructed it and splattered it out all over the place and, and grabbed a few of the elements that I still really liked for the story. And uh, then I, I rewrote. In fact, the very first, our characters got a little bit of a deeper backstory. And then from the halfway mark on, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a different story. And uh, I've renamed it appropriately. It's called Room 706, and it's part of the audiobook project. Um, there is um, another one that we've done in the past, but I went back and actually refit it. Uh, with sound effects and whatnot that involves a lycanthrope. And, and uh, so, there, you know, there's a lot of fun stuff in there. Something different, something that's not just religion, atheism, religion, atheism, religion, atheism, with a splash of politics thrown in. I'm tired. I am I know these are important battles, but I mean, you know, every day you just feel like it. Who was it who said when they log onto their social media feed, the first thing they feel is that's, screenshot from Picard on the Enterprise where he's like, damage report. Every day you and I log on and it's just damage report, damage report, damage report. It's so frustrating. It wears you down. I don't think we're wired to see this sort of minute by minute, second by second barrage, this avalanche of insanity out there. It's It's been hard. I, it's hard for me anyway. It's hard for me to... Um, To not f feel a sense of <sighs> despair is the word. It's a it's a forgive the Shakespearean nature of the of the language, but you know you, you you're like God. Uh, I need some good news. You know, um, I'm tired of watching people fight with each other. People just fight with each other all the time, and uh, the internet that has so connected us as human beings is actually in many ways disconnected us as human beings. We're fighting against avatars. We're fighting against usernames. We're, you know, busy hammering at our keyboards, trying to make a point in the Twitterverse at 240 characters. Everyone's jumping in, jumping uh, in with, uh, you know, agreement and support or insults and decrying you as all number of insult before you know it, everybody else is, has joined in on their feeds and their pages get involved and it's just a cage match. And then, you know, you multiply that times 
how many squillions of posts there are out there every single day. I don't think we're wired for this. I don't think it's healthy. I have uh, struggled in my own life. Like, how do you, how do you use the internet without allowing yourself to become weary, without burning out, without sort of getting numb? And I, uh, one of the one of the things that I've decided to do is um, I'm going to outsource some. I'm I'm still obviously going to be on social media, but I'm going to outsource. Thank you, Dave, for the ten bucks. I'm going to outsource uh, some of the content generation for the Thinking Atheist social media pages. Um, and uh, I'm going to spend less time, not to be in a, in a bubble, but I, you, know, you, can, you can get lost trying to respond to people in comment sections. Now, we have this sort of weird fantasy that we tell ourselves that... Um, if only I'm, I clearly demonstrate my point one more time on Twitter, then they'll see my point of view and they will come to agreement. <laughs> you know, I can't remember the last time that's happened. If only I express, if only I was just a bit more clear, I'll go back on Facebook and type a few more paragraphs. And, um, you know, hours go by. I mean, I, there are people I, I lament the waste of their potential and and time and lives because apparently all they do is sit around and just bitch at each other on Twitter for what? You know, make your point, take a look. In fact, here's a great example of kind of how I, I plan to approach Twitter and Facebook moving forward. When I release a video to YouTube, I will monitor the YouTube comment section usually for a day or two right after. And in the world of the internet, um, you know, if there's something that's factually wrong with it, you'll find out almost immediately. It's amazing. I mean, people will be like, no, this is, I mean, I've, I've had something go out and I've been wrong or I had something wrong and they will, they will say, Hey, you know, this is incorrect. And because they'll find it quickly, then I'm like, oh shit, I need to go back and either uh, make a note or or uh, or maybe even re-upload the whole thing. Thank you, Ira. Very very kind. Um, here's a great example. I did this video. We were talking about how people used to believe that the Earth was flat, but now we know the Earth is round. Now this is a petty example, but within five seconds. I was being roasted on YouTube because the earth is not round. The earth is an oblate spheroid. Well, you, you know my, you understand my point. Right? You understand what I was trying to say. But the oblate spheroid crowd is apparently a pretty strong lobby. And so I, I'm like, fine. So I went back, I deleted the video. I went back, I recut that section to say, now we know the Earth is an oblate spheroid, and then I re-uploaded it to YouTube. Um, and, but I was able to find that issue right off the bat. And so and when I upload a, a piece, a, a profile, a video of some kind, I'll monitor it for a day or two. And after that, I, I've moved on. If you allow yourself to get sucked into the black hole of a comments section and you're trying to to argue and argue and explain and elaborate and, and win. Um, you know, is this really the best use of your time? Is this really what you would want me doing? Would you rather me not be producing other stuff? Would you rather not be shooting a video with Dr. Donald Prothero about the fact of evolution and the many examples for it? Would you rather me not be doing a profile of activist in the movement and explaining things like street epistemology? Would you rather not be... Uh, you know, posting some sort of a, a, a speech that helps to explain the satanic panic and why it's relevant even today and why Christianity remains a fear cult that we must speak against. I mean, wouldn't you rather me be producing content than sitting over on Facebook just hammering away? But there are people who they just they just lose themselves online. Maybe it's all they have. Maybe it's all they they know. Maybe they've got that kind of time. Maybe maybe for them it's fun. But I can't imagine you would extract a lot of joy out of this life just mashing away at a computer keyboard day after day, hour after hour, 
having these online sort of tit for tat exchanges with people and all caps and cuss words and ad hominems and it just always devolves just always devolves so someone had asked me about the uh, beastmaster blu-ray experience for those who aren't familiar with me i love uh, classic 80s action and cheese ball films from my youth beastmaster starring mark singer remains a favorite i bought it on blu-ray actually i i've been waiting because i i can't really get natalie excited about it. like honey you want to go watch beastmaster <laughs> you know honey look it's about a guy who was born but actually when he was born his the fetus was transferred into the stomach of a cow and he was delivered by a witch with an eyeball ring and then he was adopted by another family and he has telepathy with animals and he hooks up with a slave girl warrior who fights in a one-piece leather swimsuit and they're teaming up with these giant bat men who can digest people with their wings <laughs> and they are doing battle against uh a guy in dreadlocks with meth mouth who likes to throw baby and in, babies into fires. I mean, it's just, you know, Natalie was just like, I'll call you. No, it's a classic, honey. I, I promise. But I got a buddy named John and uh, John, I think may come over tonight. I'm waiting on, I'm waiting on a text. He's, he's missing a deadline. He's working on a deadline. And so I think we're going to try to, uh, Right, view it tonight or tomorrow or this weekend. So I'll give you the review. And I think Natalie may sneak in and watch part of it with us, and I will give you the reaction. But um, Beastmaster is kind of a poor man's Conan, but I actually liked Beastmaster better than Conan the movie. I, I just, I never bought Thulsa Doom. I never bought James Earl Jones. I know that's sacrilege to a great many people. Um, uh, Schwarzenegger was born to play Conan, but I just felt it was a clumsy film. It was just a clumsy film. Crawl, yeah, that's another cheese ball. I love the makeup of the Cyclops. I love the guy who's who's the main character who's running around in the um, the striped tights. <laughs> I forget his name. And he had that uh, that uh, it was like a Chinese star kind of thing with these big fingers and blades on it that would come back to him and obey his commands and the. Uh, the antagonist was this big beast that was shot in extreme blur and looked like some dude in a rubber suit that they, they clumsily green screened into the back and they composited into the shot. I mean, it, it's, it's terrible. It's a, it's a terrible movie, but it's so bad. It's good. Um, there's a few like that. The sword and the sorcerer was pretty good. Hawk. The slayer was another classic from 1980, whatever. Um, did you know that Big Trouble in Little China is like 34 years old? Big Trouble in Little China is 34 years old. I, I, I saw it in the theater. And it hasn't aged extremely well, but Egg Shen remains one of my favorite characters ever on, in any film. Ice Pirates. Ice Pirates is a classic. It's a shitty film, but it's still a classic. It's difficult for me to, to really tell you why. Um, so anyway, Beastmaster will give you the review whenever, uh, <laughs> whenever we watch it. There was another thing I was going to, to bring up. What was it? Um, God, this is a random broadcast. Random broadcast. Oh, um, Talk about good, bad movies. There's a documentary used to be on Netflix. It's called The Best Worst Movie. And it's about this film called Troll 2. All right. Troll 2 has become infamous. It is a film that was made, I think, by this Italian director. And um, I can't remember his name. But it is, it is one of the worst things ever done. It's like Plan 9 from Outer Space mixed with, God, I don't even know what to mix it with. But it's so bad in such an entertaining way that the film became a cult classic. And so it has, over the last several decades, taken on new life. Troll 2 
has taken on new life. And there are people who have like midnight screenings and they have troll tube parties at their house and there are t-shirts you can buy. And so there's a documentary on Netflix. It's called Best Worst Movie, where they go and they sort of chronicle the phenomenon of this horribly shitty uh, horror film with goblins. So they're not even trolls. And uh, where the actors are now, one of them's a dentist, and they, they track these people down like decades later, and they get them all together, and they tour and show the movie to audiences all around the world. And uh, it's it's a great documentary. The documentary is actually huge fun. I mean, it's it's a well-made documentary that chronicles the uh, the popularity of this weird little horrible film. And so I watched the documentary, Best Worst Movie, and then I had to, of course, go back and watch the film itself, Troll 2. And it's just as bad as it always was. But it's bad in a way that you want to get together with, with buddies, you know, with a few drinks and crank it up and just have the time of your life. You, it is, it's good bad. It's brilliant bad. It's masterpiece bad. It is the, it is the godfather of bad movies. All right, Troll 2, but I would encourage you, before you see Troll 2, especially if you're not going to see it with friends, watch the documentary about it, Best Worst Movie, okay? Any of you guys seen Troll 2? <laughs> They've got, was it the town was called Nilbog, which was goblin spelled backward, and you see these creatures that look like these really cheeseball Halloween masks with no facial movement whatsoever, and they show up and they give people sandwiches with green goop and say, eat this, and people are supposed to eat it and turn into goblins. <laughs> and then there's the, the antagonist, who's the woman? She's like a witch. Oh, my God. Oh, it's just, and the acting is is. Terrible. I mean, it's 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 brilliant. It's the godfather of bad movies. You're welcome. You're welcome. I would have been a movie reviewer in another life, I think. Of course, you know, the most of the people I know who have done movie review type stuff, they actually became a job and they started to hate movies. They hated watching movies. So maybe I'll just keep it casual. But oh God, that's just uh, and I I try to explain to Natalie why. I love this stuff, and she just thinks I'm nuts. Flash Gordon. Flash Gordon. I'm going to have to buy Flash on Blu-ray. Soundtrack alone would be worth it. Flash Gordon is its dripping with cheese. Sam Jones and, uh, God, who was the uh, the actress who played uh, Dale? Uh, what's Dale's last name? And then Topol <laughs> plays the mad the uh, the scientist and they go and Ming the Merciless who is Max von Sydow is an amazing Ming. So to a Queen Rock soundtrack they've got bird people <laughs> and another guy uh Clytus, who's in another horrible Halloween mask that looks like it's made out of cheap plastic. Um uh, you've got uh, he was a uh, he was James Bond at one point. Timothy Dalton is in it. Uh you, uh, who played the Dale Arden? What was her name? You remember? Killer clowns from outer space. Now we're talking. Now we're talking. Battle Beyond the Stars. Thank you, Troubleshooter. Battle Beyond the Stars, where John Boy from the Waltons goes on a trip to try to save the universe, I guess, while flying a talking spaceship that's shaped like a woman's breasts. Uh, George Pappard plays Space Cowboy. Sybil Danning plays, I don't even know what her name is because it didn't matter. <laughs> A scantily clad space mercenary. Uh, oh, God, there was, uh, there was all kinds of gems in, in uh, Battle Beyond. Oh, I got to write that one down. Battle Beyond. I wonder if that's on Blu-ray. You know what? Let's find out. Hang on. Amazon.com. Battle Beyond the Stars Blue Ray. <sighs> Doesn't come up. Oh, wait, wait. Roger Corman's cult classic on Blu ray for 1929. Let's just read the description Shad Richard Thomas. Excuse me, I'm going to sniffle here. Must scour the cosmos to recruit mercenaries from different planets and cultures in order to save his peaceful home planet from the threats of the evil tyrant 
Sador, played by John Saxon. He was, um, he played the girl's father in Nightmare on Elm Street, the 1984 film, who's bent on dominating and enslaving the entire universe. Joining this magnificent seven of mercenaries are the deadly Gelt, Carefree Cowboy, and the sexy Valkyrie Saint X-Men. James Horner did the soundtrack. I'm going to put that in my cart. <laughs> I got to put that in my cart. Barbarella is another great one. Night of the Triffids, or is it Day of the Triffids? I don't think it's Night of the Triffids. I think it's Day of the Triffids. All right. Sorry for that digression, but you know, we're going to talk about bad movies. Now we're in my sandbox. Now we're in my... Uh, Melody Anderson played Dale Arden. And Jonathan, thank you very much for doing the uh, recon on that. Before I call it a day, is there anything else that is on your mind? Anything else you want to talk about or, uh, or mention? Would you like another uh, chapter out of uh, the Holy Bible, A Bridge to Beyond the Point of Usefulness? A book that I continue to have on my bookshelf at the house. Haggai, which is also known as Haggai, and it's an actual book, Haggai. And no one ever quotes from the book of Haggai, have you noticed? Haggai prophesies that everyone better hurry up and build the temple or bad stuff will happen in Israel. Changed that or to and, and he was 100% correct. Galatians, dear Galatians, I'm the only one who talks to God. That's our arrangement. Okay. If someone else says he's talking, he's full of it. Very sincerely, Paul. I just summed up the entire book of Galatians. Let's do Revelation real fast. We read the Bible abridged beyond all usefulness. Revelation. Dear everyone, guys, I was on the island of Patmos when, whoa, an angel started talking. Then the angel said, write all this down. And he said, God's going to play some trumpets so loud it'll kill a bunch of people. Then angels are going to drop some big bowls of plague on earth and kill a bunch more than hail and dragons and so forth. But then we get a new Jerusalem and sin is abolished. Should be any minute now, sincerely, John, Island of Patmos, Spring Break, A.D. 96. The Holy Bible, abridged beyond the point of usefulness. Uh... I guess that's going to be about it. Appreciate you guys hanging out with me. It's always fun. Thanks for the uh, patience during some technical issues that we've had, but uh, hopefully they're mostly worked out, and I'll continue to try to tweak the settings so that you guys get the smoothest playback possible. I'll see you back here on the radio next week, and in the meantime, take care. <laughs>